All right. Well, hey, what's up, everybody here in the South Campus? Can we do a big, a big, do me a big favor? And we got three places we're going to say hi to today. We're going to say hi to our North Campus. We're going to say hi to our downtown campus. And we're going to say hi to our small group meeting in Fort McMurray. They're meeting today. Let's give it up for everybody, part of the family. Love that we get to be together. If we've never met before, my name's Jonathan, and my wife Natasha and I are the lead pastors here. And man, I am excited for this series. This is going to be good. And if you came in uh, with a little bit of apprehension, you know, sex with the lights on, what are they talking? Well, it's obvious what we're talking about. It's not, of course, of course, we're talking about sex, romance, and love. And I just want to encourage you, we got to lean in. This might be one of the most important series we've ever done because the devil wants us to think incorrectly about sex, love, and romance. And if he can do that, it doesn't just impact our relationships with each other. It can derail our relationship with him. And so the whole point, we just got, we've got to expose the truth. We've got to shine some light on the truth of what God's word says when it comes to sex, love, and romance. And I had a couple people this morning ask me, like, hey, is it okay? I've got a 10-year-old. I've got an 11-year-old. Can they come in? Of course they can. My 10-year-old's going to be in the second service. And, uh, and so uh, we just, I really feel like I want her to hear it first in church. And, if, and to be honest, it's probably not first. We know because we've been having the conversations with her at home. And so if you feel like, ah, oh, I, I don't want my kid to hear that, they already hear it. So they're hearing something, and I promise you what they're hearing at school is a dilution of the truth. So let's get them into God's house. Let's present them with the truth so they can grow up with the truth as their guide. Man, I'm excited. Okay, 1 John chapter 1. We, we've, we are pulling from so many different sources over the next several weeks. We've got the Bible of course, we got studies from the U of A, studies from the U of T, lots of different pastors and authors, Swipe Right by Levi Lusco, The Meaning of Marriage, Timothy Keller. I'm just giving you some good reads here. Love, Sex, and Dating by Andy, Andy Stanley. Loveology, Kiss Me Like You Mean It. Books by Gary Chapman, The Canadian Census, Time Magazine. There's a lot of sources that are going into this. That's basically, that's my footnotes for the next four weeks because um, I'd have to stop every three minutes if I was going to cite all of that. But just know there's a lot of good research and there's a lot out there. If you're looking for resources, reach out to the office, ask us. We'll hook you up with some stuff that'll be very helpful. Okay, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This is the life-giving message we heard him share. And it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. God is pure light. You will never find even a trace of darkness in him. If we claim that we share life with him but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we keep living in the pure light that surrounds him, we share unbroken, I love that, unbroken fellowship, unbroken relationships with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you're here, and that really makes the difference. Lord, I pray that you'd um, help us to have open hearts as we dig into the truth from your word on sex, love, and romance. God, be with me as I tackle this topic in front of my 10-year-old and my in-laws. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> You think it's awkward to listen to. Imagine being the one sharing it. You got your father-in-law staring you in the eye. It's all good. Four kids. He knows how that happened. Okay. It's too late, Tony. Okay. All right. He's not in this service, I don't think, so it's cool. He would break me in half if he wanted to. Okay. Man, nobody, nobody likes to be left in the dark, right? You don't, nobody wants to be kept out of the loop. We, my wife and I are both very nosy people. And so around our house, like if, if I hear her phone go off, I mean, this happened yesterday. It goes off. It's on the counter. She's in the other room. I always do a walk by. Who's texting you? Hmm. Okay. Just your ladies. All right. I see it. And she's, she's got that. She hasn't turned the preview off yet on her new phone so I can read the messages. So I'm like, oh, okay, you're going out with them. Thanks for letting me know. All right, okay, fine, fine, fine. She does the same to me. 
She always, if, I, if, if I leave my phone around and it, it vibrates, or go, she's, she's always checking. And some of you might think that's really controlling and weird, but if you think that way, you probably have something to hide on your phone. Uh, we don't really care. We're just nosy like that. And so, so it's all, but, but it, it extends, you know, if I know that she's been out during the day and she's met with one of her girlfriends or she meets with one of you, um, when I think that, that time together is over, I call her like, hey, what'd you talk about? Nothing. We like went for coffee. We were talking about decor. Yeah, but, but did you talk about anything good? Like, tell me, what did you really talk? That's it. That's all we, and she's the same way. If I, if I walk into the house and um, sometimes I'll pull up in the back parking pad and I'll be there for a minute. She knows if I'm there for a minute that I'm probably talking on the phone. And so, um, so but then when I come in, she's like, who are you talking to? I'm like, just my friend. Why? What, is, what were you talking about? And we just, we got to know. And, and neither of us like to be left in the dark. And so um, we, we, we tried to leverage this natural curiosity that we both have thinking, man, this must have spilled into our children and so at Christmas, we thought we're going to make them feel like they're in the dark. We got a surprise for you at Christmas, a special surprise. And we, we did, but we knew that telling them early would torture them just a little bit. The problem is that when you're left in the dark and you don't know all the details, you start to fill in the blanks. And so they started talking to one another. They were having these secret kids-only, no parents allowed meetings. And they're chatting things through. And they started to conjure up in their minds and their little hearts so deceived that they thought the surprise was a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> so Christmas morning... At my house, celebrating the birth of our Lord. We haven't even jumped into the stockings yet. And they're like, <laughs> like so excited. We're like, man, they are really excited this year. This is amazing. They're so excited for their stockings and their underwear and the socks we got them. And then finally, one of them's just like, when did we get our trip to Disneyland? We're like, <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, guys, we did have a surprise for you, but it wasn't Disneyland. They're like, <sighs> like you just see their countenance totally change. Like, we're going to Edmonton. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but then they're just like the best kids, so they're like, to the water park at the mall. They're like, we're going to the water park. They were so excited, but we weren't going to the water park. <laughs> so we're like, um, well, we're going to the mall, but we're just going to go look for some deals for mom and dad. It's kind of like our Christmas. Hey. <laughs> They're like, but we thought we were going to go to Disneyland and then the water you can see them processing all of this new information. They haven't even gotten into their Christmas gifts yet, and Christmas is a complete and total failure. And I was like, so then we're like, okay, but guys, we booked a hotel with a family suite. We got a room for mommy and daddy, and we got a room for you. It's kind of a treat for, <laughs> for mommy and daddy, but we got a room for both of you, for all of us. It's going to be great. It's got a pool with a slide. They're like, it's not Disney, but okay. So we start driving to Edmonton. We pack them up. You know, we drive three hours to get to, like, the nation's busiest mall two days after Christmas. And the whole time, we're walking around the mall. It's like four hours or something. And we're dangling the promise of the hotel pool in front of them. Like, guys, can't wait. They're like, we're so tired. We don't want to shop anymore. You're not buying us anything. I'm like, because we bought you so many things. It's our Christmas now. And so... And so we just kept holding out in front of them, but if you're good, you're going to get to go swimming. You know, you just, you're going to take it away. Like, what parent does that? We do, okay? So, you know, he's a good father that gives good gifts. We just threaten to take them away if you don't behave. Um, so we're like, we're like, yeah, but if, come on, we're just going to press through one more store and we're going to get to go swimming. Like, okay. And so we get, we get to the hotel and, oh. Uh, uh, we go up to the counter, and my wife actually went up first, and um, she, I was, I was kind of parking. I let them all out, and it's cold. She's, she's up at the counter. I parked the car, and then I come in, and I come in. I'm, I'm ready to go. I've been waiting for the swim. I've been promising my kids this night away, and 
she, she like comes walking from the counter towards me at the entrance, and she's kind of stone-faced. She's like, <sighs> I'm like, what? She's like, the floor that our suite was on is under construction, and they don't have a room for us. I was like, oh, they, they will find one. <laughs> Went up to the counter. I'm like, Ex- excuse me. We booked a family suite. We were here for the family suite. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Um, the floor's under construction, and um, so we don't have a family suite for you. This is this is 100% true. Uh, and he says, "But we can we can put you in another room." I'm like, "Thanks, buddy." Uh, and he says, "And and and I said, well, one one room. There's like six of us, man, and we were kind of planning on having our own room, if you know what I mean. I got a sermon series coming up. We need to do some research, and so <laughs> just trying to just." Just learning. And so, um, <laughs> and so I'm like, buddy, we, and he said, okay, I got two rooms for you. And we're like, okay. And my wife said, are they, are they like the connected rooms? So we can just, you know, we got that door. And he's like, yeah, they're, they're connected. She's like, so clarify, like, we got the door. We can go through. He's like, yeah, like, they're connected. Like, all you have to do to go from one room to the next is just go. This is no joke. He said, just go out the door, down the hallway, and into the next. That's what he said. I'm like, buddy, that is not connected rooms. I cannot put my children in a room down the hall by themselves. And so the kid, I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. There's no suite. But, but let's go. We got a room. We're going to get our swimsuits on. We're going to go swim. And he's like, oh, sir, sir, I'm sorry. Um, the pool's under construction as well. It needs repairs. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I'm like, buddy, my kids thought they were going to Disneyland two days ago, and I've been selling them on your stupid pool. Fill it up. It's like there's nothing we can do. I'm like, can you send me? Is there another hotel? I will not mention the name or the franchise. Is there another one in the city that has a pool you can send me to? Not tonight, sir. I'm really so I'm like, dude, you have no idea how bad I need a pool. Like, I need a pool. And I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. There's no pool. Like, they're like, they had their heart set on Disneyland. We ended up in a dumpy hotel with a broken pool. Disneyland? Dumpy Hotel in Edmonton, love you Edmonton, with a broken pool. Southern California. Edmonton. (laughs) Mickey Mouse, Disneyland. Cockroaches, broken pool. Like it just, it was like the ultimate letdown for my kids. And I think that sometimes when it comes to sex, love, and romance, We've got ideas that look like Disneyland. Like we all have some dreams and some expectations. Like, man, I I, I imagine it's going to be like this and I'm going to be so fulfilled and it's going to be so, uh, it's going to be amazing. And I can't, I, 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 we were pursuing Disneyland, but we always seem to end up in a hotel with a broken pool. We've got this idea, and, and, and this, this idea that love, sex, and romance is supposed to be great isn't just something we've made up on our own. It's actually God's idea. God's plan for love, sex, and romance is like Disneyland. It's like dreams come true. It's magical. It's wonderful. Like he's got... He's got big plans for us in the area of sex, love, and romance. And and to the point where I believe God's plan for us in sex, love, and romance is that we would have like, we'd have like maximum pleasure. We'd find strength. We'd find joy. And we'd find all of his blessings. Like those things are there for us in his plan for our relationships. That's, That's his design. Starts in Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created. This has to be the lens through which we understand the world, but especially how we understand love, sex, and romance. Like nothing exists that wasn't created by God. That includes your desires. That includes your estrogen, your testosterone, your your body parts, all of it created by him. Sex is His idea, created by him. Marriage, created by him. His idea. So the same God that created, and we have, it's like we have this um, ability to believe 
that he created the world and he created the stars and he created the planets and he created the animals and the plants and all of these things. But when it comes to sex, love, and romance, we don't trust him as the creator. Because see, there's, there's, but we, so we have to get our heads wrapped around this idea that, that he created all of it. And because he's the creator, he's the only one who can speak with authority on the function and value of his creation. And so for too long, especially in this particular area of love, sex, and romance, we have not looked to the creator to be our God, but we've simply looked to creation. And we've been taking our cues from other people, and it's like the blind leading the blind. God starts creating Genesis chapter 1 and He's day one, he finishes up. He's like, man, I'm good. It's good. I love everything I did today. Day two, create some more stuff. He's like, wow, another great job, God. Way to go. Day three, day four, day five, day six. He's like, man, I'm really on to something here. I'm a very good creator. Every day, he's like, this is so good. And then you get to Genesis chapter 2 and, and verse 16. And then he looks at Adam all by himself. And it's the first time where God acknowledges that something might not be good. So it's been all of these good things he's created. And he looks at Adam. Adam's alone. He says, man, it is not good for man to be alone. Long story short, and we're going we're gonna to dive into Adam's single life um, later in this series. And then it's really important because you might think you got married problems. What you have are probably two single people problems that you never got resolved. And now you're just married when your problems are compounding. So we've got to learn from Adam, and we will. But long story short, he drops Eve into his life. And Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. This is God's plan for sex, love, and romance. It's to get married, to be united with one person, to be naked, and to feel no shame. God has a design for this area of your life. The creator has created a plan and a roadmap for this area of our lives that should we follow his design will lead to pleasure, joy, strength, and blessing. The problem is that his design is not our default. Right, see our our default is actually to be in the dark. Our default is not to trust him with these areas of our lives. And when you don't follow his design and you just follow the default, because see, your relationships will either happen by design or happen by default. And when they happen by default instead of design, you trade pleasure for pain, you trade joy for judgment, you trade strength for shame, you trade blessing for brokenness. So are we going to follow his design or are we going to be led by our defaults. I'm going to ask Pastor Quincy and Mandy to join me on stage here. Got a little, got a little, it's going to be good, okay? So just, everybody, well, I don't know if it's going to be good. We haven't given it a test run, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so here comes Pastor Quincy. So Pastor Quincy, uh, why don't you come down here, and you can stand here, and you are, Pastor Mandy, you can stay there. Oh, perfect, you've got some props. Okay, just stay, don't move. Okay, um, I'll hold Minnie. You can put that. You can put the hat on. There, it's great. It works. Okay, so what we have here is man. Okay, <laughs> looking, looking for fulfillment in the area of sex, love, and romance. What we have down here is Disneyland. Okay, we've got. God's best, our hopes, our dreams, our expectations. Pastor Mandy represents God's full plan for sex, love, and romance. Right here, Pastor Quincy, right here, and this is important that we use the married couple for this, right here is pleasure. (laughs) This is pleasure, this is joy, this is strength, this is blessing, right here, okay? And so he's agreeing with me, which is probably a good thing. Probably a good thing. Now here's... Here's the problem, is that the verse we read from 1 John says if we live in the pure light, if we have a relationship with God and we live in the light, then we share unbroken fellowship or relationship with one another. Unbroken. It's unbroken. And the blood of Jesus 
continually cleanses us from all of our sin. So if, if being in the light or the truth on the subject leads to unbroken relationships and a continual cycle of cleansing and forgiveness, then, then the, the, the reverse would also be true that being in darkness on the topic leads to broken relationships and a cycle of guilt, shame, and condemnation. If one is true, then the other also has to be true. And it's not hard to find proof to back this up. In fact, our world is full, and most of us would agree that when it comes to sexuality and relationships and romance and love, there is a lot more brokenness, probably even in every room today that we are gathered, there's probably a lot more brokenness and guilt and shame than there is unbroken relationship and continual cleansing. And it's because we're living and trying to navigate our way from where we are to where God's best is for us. We're trying to do it all in the dark. And, and one of the issues is that while God has made the, made the path very clear and obvious, follow his direction and his design, and you'll arrive at his predetermined destination for your life, that culture has convoluted everything in between. There are so many things now that try and tell you to get from here to here a different way. Right? There's, in fact, we are inundated, overwhelmed with opinions and articles and websites and books and talk shows and examples of, of ways that people are trying to pursue that that is outside of God's design. And the problem is they, they're trying to get to Disneyland, but they're ending up in Edmonton. <laughs> and it's, it's just not working. And so I've asked, uh, I, I think we've got about... 12, 14 people, something that are going to help me out. So if you can just, whoever you are, because Heather and I were recruiting you together, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I just trust that you'll show up. Come on over here to the front side of the stage. I just need your help for a minute. Okay, there we go. Oh, look at this. Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, great. Okay. So one at a time. So we'll start with Christina. So you come on over. Um, and then Bryce, I'll call you out in a second. Okay, so what have we got here? Okay, so we've got divorce. Okay, so come on this way. And Christina, you can stand right here, and she's, um, so divorce is something that has just become, it's like just an opt-out in our culture now. In fact, some interesting stats on divorce, um, when, you look at, uh, when you look at couples over 50, divorce has doubled in the last 20 years. Why? Because we haven't, we haven't prepared each other how to live without the responsibility of kids. And so we get free time and we don't know what to do with each other. We've gotten, we've gotten so used to the only thing we have in common being the people we're trying to raise. We haven't had a dating life with one another. We haven't prioritized romance with one another. We haven't made it proper investments in our relationship. And so the divorce rate has doubled in that demographic. Now something that is encouraging, you know, there's a lot of people that are like 50% of marriages end in divorce. Actually, not in Canada. It's actually only 38%. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But on the, on the flip side, if, if your car only started 62% of the time, you would say, my car sucks. It's broken. We got to get it fixed. And so the truth is, if only 62% of the time marriage is working, there's something in our culture that's caused it to be broken. Right, so, so divorce is one of those things that starts to get in the way because we think it's just an option. Now, I'm not, I don't know every situation, and there are, some, there are certain circumstances, and so this isn't a broad brushstroke. But the fact of the matter is, like, divorce has become like dating. If you're not happy in the relationship, you go find somebody new. Okay? Bryce, what do we got? Oh, hey, Bryce. Me first. So I'll get you to stand, like, right here. So we've got like the me first mentality, which is just getting into a relationship looking for what you want and not caring about what the other person wants. We have a, like culture is self-absorbed and completely obsessed with what's best for me and how I feel. Okay, let's see what we got next. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Kinsey. What's Kinsey? Okay, I'll tell you. So I'm, I'm, we're trying to set here, Lindsay. Why don't you take, take a step back this way? Okay, there we go. Um, so Alfred Kinsey was... Uh, man, in the 1940s, he started to do some research on sexual behavior. And there still is a Kinsey Institute. They do a bunch of research on these things. But what, what's interesting about him is he was married, uh, but he and his wife were also swingers. 
and they swung into same-sex relationships. That was part of their pattern of sexual behavior. So this guy is doing research on sexual behavior. Um, his, primary, um, his, his primary objects of study uh, were prostitutes, uh, prisoners, and some of his same-sex partners. Those were the people he was using. And so, well, God has a great plan for all three of those groups of people. The fact of the matter is his research was skewed and limited to a very small segment of the population. And unfortunately, even with that very segmented uh, research, his research started to become very prevalent, not only just as far as he was propagating it, but he got hooked up with a, not hooked up, not like Tinder hooked up. He got connected with, I got to watch the language in this series, but he got connected with a lady named Mary Calderon, who was one of the early pro-choice advocates and for abortion. And the two of them got funded, catch this, by Hugh Hefner. And that, that became the foundation for the very first sex ed that got into pub, the public school system. So think about, think about how distorted the perspective on sexuality is when you look at the roots of where it's come from. And so sex ed in North America has now been a byproduct and a continuation of those roots. And so, so we've got divorce and a me-first attitude, but we also, all of us, have grown up and been educated in a system that started and it was fundamentally flawed from its, from its very beginning. Okay, what do we got next? The 60s. All right. Sure, you can go right, like right here, Hannah. That's great. So we got the 60s and this, the sexual revolution where sex became more recreation um, than procreation. And I just want to be real, like, it is for recreation. God intended it for your pleasure, but in the context of a marriage relationship. So it's not for just casual one night, I need a fix. It's not, that's not the point. But that's what got popular during the sexual revolution. Okay, what do we got here, Doug? The 90s, reluctant to find he's stuck in the 90s again. Okay, so there we go. Not Doug. Doug's not stuck in the 90s. But the way many of us think about sex, love, and romance is stuck in the 90s. Because if you grew up in the 80s or 90s, even though it was toxic and started here, a lot of the education that's, that was in the school system, and I love the school system. My kids are in it. We got great teachers, and we're, we're believing for great things. But... It's all about the physical act and generally leaves out the emotional and spiritual components of what happens sexually. And so we were raised to think safe sex could happen as long as we were physically protected with no concern for our emotional and spiritual protection. And so then you've got, you've got the 90s. Okay, who's next? Hollywood. All right. Okay, so we just go right back here. So we got Hollywood. Obviously, we look at these, we look at relationships and people and people we idolize, and, and what happens in Hollywood starts to set a precedent for what happens in our own lives and our culture. Even though we look at them and think, man, that's not real, there's something in that that grabs our heart. Okay, who do we have next? The internet. Hello, the internet. Okay, come on, you can go right here, Olga, that's perfect. Um, the internet has been has been one, it's, it's a, an incredibly powerful tool, and it's an incredibly destructive tool. The accessibility of pornography, and I think, does somebody have porn? Not, does somebody have the word porn? <laughs> Sarah does. Okay, you can come on up. It's very clear here. Please, the word. These two kind of have, wow. These two have to go together, okay? And so what's happened is with the rise of the internet has come the accessibility of sexual content. One in every three 13-year-old boys is physically addicted to pornography, viewing it more than 52 times a week right now in North America. Over 70,000 searches a day are done for pornographic material. Or Sorry, that's, that's way low. That is not 70 million. And 30,000 people are viewing pornographic material every second. The internet has changed the way... We connect with each other. Okay, we got bring out, bring out Tinder. That's great. You can just you can come on up in here. That's fine. That's cool. Wherever we'll find some space. Um, the rise of like mobile dating apps and internet dating. Now, I want to be very clear. There's nothing wrong with meeting somebody online. Part of our romantic spark was kindled through emails. We understand the magic of an online relationship. There's more to that, but but. If you got the Tinder app, the stats suggest that you're not using it to find someone to have coffee with. The stats suggest 
that you jump on when you're bored and you swipe and you hook up and you have non-committed sexual relationships and that, that's what you're using Tinder for. That's what the stats would suggest. And it's, it's a broken way of trying to find what God has ultimately promised by his design, okay? We've got another one. You can go right here. Ashley Madison, website directed specifically at married couples. Slogan, life is short, have an affair, okay? Again, toxic. We got 1,260. That's the amount of sexual assaults that are happening in Canada every single day. 1,260. 70%. We can keep coming out. You can come on over here. 70%. That's, the, that's how many women in Canada say they're not sexually satisfied. Men, we can do better, okay? Um, then we got the church. We got the church. See, the church has been problem. Okay, right there's good. The uh, perfect. The church has been problematic in this whole thing, because coming out of even the Reformation in the 1500s, so uh, like even before that, Plato, 400 years before Jesus, started to talk about this separation of of our um, of our body and our spirit, as if the physical was negative and the spiritual was positive. Some of that teaching drifts into like Martin Luther and that whole movement and really created a church environment that said to, to feel pleasure is wrong and so we just have, have to endure life till we get to heaven. That's just not true. And it's trickled into the church's stance on sexual things where a lot of people have been under a church covering that has said no to everything and yes to nothing. And it's not that saying no to all of these different things is, a, is bad, but the Bible doesn't start talking about sex with a no. It starts talking about sex with a yes. It says, hey, you're here. Your wife is here. You're naked. Be fruitful and multiply. That's what the Bible says. Why do we start with the negative and what we're against instead of just saying, hey, guys, there's a better way? What if we could just shine a light on a better way? And then we've got, we've got finally, and we're going to have to spread all over. Mandy, why don't you come over here, front corner. And perfect. And what happens is you try and travel through everything that culture shows us, and you end up here, and pain, judgment, shame, and brokenness are in the way of what God's plan is for your life. And, and again, the challenge do you have that, uh, thank you very much, guys, the Toronto Maple Leaf scarf, best team on the planet, beat the Canadians last night, hello, no big deal, and so here, I, wa I want you to see what happens. When we're in the dark on God's plan, Okay, Pastor Quincy, I want you to just move forward without any help and find your way to your wife. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he bumps into Tinder. The sixth. Whoa, easy, easy. Careful, careful. <laughs> Maybe lead with your elbows. Maybe not your hands. Not your hands. <laughs> We didn't think this all through. <laughs> okay, he's been impacted by the church. Whoa, 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 okay, we're good. We're good. You're good. I don't want to. Okay, there? you're good. You're good. Okay. It's just me. It's just me. Okay. As you can see, to try and make the journey from where you are to what God has promised you blind is going to result in you being impacted by the flow of culture. Okay, come back with me. You can take this off. Okay, come back with me. We're going to be impacted by the flow of culture. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 tells a story. It says, and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and, and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. When you're blind, you can only go where the crowd leads you. And so when you're blind about what God's plan is for sex, love, and romance, you will only go where the crowd leads, the crowd leads you. And so that's why, listen, if we're walking blind, that's why we end in divorce. And we're looking for love on Tinder. And we, we've been misled and miseducated. And we're not sexually satisfied in all of these different things because it's the blind leading the blind. But watch what happens. Jesus keeps going. He says, uh, he, he let him out, and then he spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him. And he said to him, do you see anything? 
And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his, his, uh, his hands on his eyes again. And he opened his eyes and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly and he sent them to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Okay, Pastor Quincy, now that you can see, I'd like you to start over here and I'd like you to try and make it to God's plan and design for you without bumping into all of the negative things that culture shows. <laughs> Almost there. Okay, so here's the deal. This isn't going anywhere. We, we can't expect culture to change. We can't expect a culture that is not being led and founded on principles from Scripture to change. But what we can do is say, God, I want to see your design. I don't want to be in the dark anymore. I want to see what you want me to see. And if we can see what God's plan is, we'll be able to navigate our way through all the negative things that are trying to destroy our relationships and still get to his plan. And now, come on back for a second, Pastor Quincy. This is, this is probably the most important part of this whole thing. Is that you can, you can, close your eyes for a sec. I don't have time to tie you up, okay? You can be, stop right there. You can be blind and it can lead you to divorce. Guess what? God can open your eyes and you can still get to his plan. You can be blind, and you can, you can be looking for love on Tinder, and you can be having one night stand after one night stand, and it's not fulfilling, and it's leaving you empty, but God can open your eyes to his design, and you can still make it to his plan. You can be over here. You can be in a marriage and not be sexually satisfied and not be relationally satisfied, and God, in a moment, can start to open your eyes to his plan and his design, and you can make it to joy and blessing and strength and pleasure. It doesn't matter where you start today because if you're willing to say, God, it's clearly broken. I'm clearly broken. Consider me one of the ones that's been impacted by culture, but I know where I want to go. And if you can say, God, I know where I want to go and I trust that you're the only one to get me, where, that get me there, guess what? He can do it. It doesn't matter where you start today. I don't care if you're single, married, searching, divorced, common law, confused. It really is not important. What's important is that if we would just say, God, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. I, I want to have sex, love, and romance that's fulfilling and joy-filled and strong and a blessing and full of purpose and pleasure. That's what I want. Then he'll take you there. We just have to ask him to open our eyes. Can you give it up for this crew? Go ahead, give it up for all them. Thanks, everybody. What's the, what, this is like an introduction to the series, but what's the bottom line? It's not too late. It's not too late for your sex, love, and romantic life and your dreams and the desires of your heart to be fully fulfilled through Christ. It's not too late. And I believe that today... Jesus wants to lead some people out of the crowd that they've been influenced by, and he wants to just simply touch your vision and say, hey, I want you, you can see differently. You can see differently. I've, because this is the beautiful thing about this story. It says he opened his eyes and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus didn't just come to restore his vision, which he did do. But then he says he sent him home, saying, don't even enter the village. Jesus didn't just make his eyes work. He then gave him very specific directions and instructions on how to get to his destination. God wants to give somebody specific directions and instructions on how to get to where they're going. I'm not interested in this series and standing on a soapbox and screaming about what we're against. I'm not interested in taking a stand against people. We love people, but we want to love them where they are and help them see that they're not defined by their mistakes. They can be defined by the maker, and we just want to help close the gap. That's it. That's this series in a nutshell. It's how do we get from where we are today to where God has, has prepared for us? I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I think at every campus, in every location, there are people, and, and, and we haven't touched. We, man, we're going to get so deep and so detailed over the next several weeks. But there are people in every room today, and you know that at some level, you are broken in the area of sex, love, and relationships. And if we're really being honest, that's all of us to some point. 
And so, God, right now, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in every campus, in every location, every service, God. God, we pray and ask that you would help us to see, God, what you have created for us to experience. God, we don't want what the world offers. We don't want to be led by culture, God. We want to be led by you. We will follow your design, not our default. God, we believe and trust you with the end result. And before we're done today, with everybody's heads bowed and everybody's eyes closed, there are some people in the room. And, and it's one thing to trust God with your relationships, but you've actually never made the decision just to trust him with your life. You've never made the decision to say, God, I, I don't need to try and find fulfillment on my own. I believe that you are the ultimate source of everything that I need. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. And so I'm going to count to three. And at all our campuses, if that's you, and you know, hey, I need, I need to start a relationship with Jesus. I, I, can't keep, I can't keep doing what I've been doing. I keep ending up broken, guilt, shame, condemnation. That's, just, that's not what God has for you. So you know you need a change. When I hit three, I want you to slip up your hand. And that's just an outward sign that says, God, I don't have it all figured out, but I know that I need you. Here we go. One at every campus. Two Three, go ahead, slip up your hand. Great, amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you here in the south. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you. I know there's hands in the north and there's hands downtown right now. God's speaking to some hearts. You can put your hands down. Listen, if you made that decision, I want you to repeat this very simple prayer after me. We're just going to say a prayer. And in doing that, we're going to commit our lives to Jesus and ask him to come in and be the one that leads us. Here we go. Everybody, let's pray it together. Say, Jesus... I need you. I can't figure it out on my own. Forgive me for my mistakes and come into my life. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's give our best shout. Let's congratulate everybody at every campus, North Campus, downtown, everyone that made that decision.